welcome once again. We are uh, somewhat saddened to still be gathered in this way, having to record these messages, but as always, we are grateful that we have the ability to do this, and we are praying as a church that we'll feel that connection together, uh, that God will sort of bind our hearts together, even in this unusual way as we worship together. So uh, I want to ask you to do a couple things, if uh, particularly for our church members, but anybody that may be watching here with us, is that you wouldn't just use this as a chance to watch a sermon, but that you would uh, use it as an opportunity to privately worship, whether it's with your family, immediate loved ones, friends, neighbors, that you might take this opportunity, even if you're by yourself, um, to fully worship the Lord, not just by watching this sermon, but if you would um, do some of the things that we normally do in worship here, that you would sing, uh, maybe find an opportunity, and if you can't sing together, maybe listen to uh, some good hymns or spiritual songs uh, that God may work in your heart in that way, uh, that you would offer prayers, both of confession and of thanksgiving and of supplication where you're asking things of the Lord. Uh, and that uh, you also would pray with and for one another, uh, whoever you may be gathered with, and then uh, turn your attention to the word as we share in it together. So I want to ask God that he will use this in that special way and that he will stir in all of our hearts what he wants to do to us, and more than anything, that he would bind us together in worship uh, together as a body of Christ, although we're separated by space, uh, but spiritually we would come together today. So would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we ask in this special way today that as we come to worship, and we do want to thank you that we have this special privilege uh, to worship together. I pray that you would use our time wherever it may be and whoever it may be with this day, that you would use it for your benefits and for uh, for our benefit and for your glory, that you would do uh, your work in our hearts, that uh, as we pray, as we sing, as we uh, turn our attention to the word, uh, that you would stir in our hearts. The work of the Holy Spirit would take place in a way that makes us more like Christ, uh, that you would teach us, grow us up into full maturity in Christ. And so we give ourselves to you for that purpose now, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to turn again today to the book of Exodus, we'll continue our look at the gospel in the Old Testament, particularly in Exodus. That good news is everywhere in Exodus. And the title of the sermon today is Say So. And it comes from, uh, not from this Exodus passage, but from Psalm 107. Psalm 107 begins this way, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And that could summarize much of what uh, we've seen take place in the lives of God's people in the book of Exodus, that there is much to give thanks for. There is many places in which we see God is good. And when it says his steadfast love endures forever and ever, we've seen that take place over and over, that God is showing uh, his special kind of covenant love for his people. But verse 2 in Psalm 107 says this, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble. Now there's a command there from that psalm as part of worshiping a God, giving thanks to God for his goodness, for his steadfast love that endures forever. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 107, you should say so when you know that to be true. And so I love this passage in Exodus. We've been uh, a lot of places here in Exodus. We've seen God delivering his people in miraculous ways. We've seen them now as they've come out of bondage in uh, to freedom. God is teaching them how to walk with God, testing them uh, with food and drink. And we've seen God's gracious provision of all that they needed as they wander. They begin in this wilderness wanderings. We've even seen last week God uh, saves them in the midst of warfare. God gives an enemy into their hands. And so once again, we reflect on all that's taken place in Exodus. And it's one of those places in which we're reminded sometimes to tell this story is to say, you wouldn't believe it if I told you what God has done. I want to make a case for all of us today, for me and hopefully for you, you can see that you have a story like Moses is going to tell here of 
a miraculous, a spectacular thing that God has done in your life. This psalm said, let the redeemed of the Lord. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, the gospel says that you have moved from death to life. We even sing a song often, I once was blind, but now I see. I once was lost, but now I'm found. You have a story that's brought you from separation and alienation from God to redemption and salvation. And this passage reminds us, you should say so. And we should say it with excitement. Um, one of the things that's true that you wouldn't believe it if I told you is what's called a movie or a TV trope. A trope is just something, it's a device that's used in telling a story and it's so commonplace that we know it's happening as we see it. How many times in a TV show or a movie, maybe even in books that we read, when a character says, you wouldn't believe it if I told you. Almost always, if not always, either we've already heard the story, we're in the middle of telling of the story, or that character is surely going to tell the story. We should tell our story, and we should be excited to say, this is so spectacular that you wouldn't believe it if I told you. Not just the story of Exodus, but my story and your story is worth telling because God is showing his steadfast love. He's showing his goodness, his mercy, his power, his omnipotence over all things and all people and even all gods, as we'll be reminded here, that it is a story to be told. The redeemed of the Lord should say so. So I believe this passage is a reminder that God's work, his deliverance and his salvation among his people is to be celebrated and it is to be shared because God uses that shared story for his purposes. So let's read both uh, this story that gets recounted here in Exodus chapter 18 and then we see immediately how God uses it. Um, in the lives of these people. So let me set the scene just a little bit. They've come off of this last passage where that God's given them victory over the Amalekites. And now there's a reunion that takes place. Sometime during all these events that have taken place, Moses sent his wife and his children away back to his wife's father, Moses' father-in-law, whose name is Jethro. And so at the beginning of chapter 18, this Jethro appears. Now we've read about him way back in the beginning of Exodus before uh, Moses went back to Egypt um, with God's call to go to Pharaoh. He asked Jethro's permission. Can I take my family and go? And Jethro sends him with his blessing. Back then we learned that his name can be Ruel as well as Jethro, but here he's called Jethro. And so there's a, a, a reunion both with Moses with his father-in-law, who's kind of the main character here, but also with his wife Zipporah and two sons that we're going to hear about here as well. So let's read from God's Word, Exodus chapter 18, and we'll read about this storytelling, this say-so that takes place for Moses and his father-in-law. So Exodus chapter 18, beginning with verse 1, hear the word of the Lord. Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Now Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, had taken Zipporah, Moses' wife, and after he had sent her home along with her two sons. The name of the one was Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. And the name of the other, Eliezer, for he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness where he was encamped at the mountain of God. And when he sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law, Jethro, am coming to, uh, to you with your wife and two sons with her. Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him, and they asked each other of their welfare and went into the tent. Then Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them on the way, and how the Lord had delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel. 
in that he had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods because in this affair they dealt arrogantly with the people. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders in Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. This is God's word for us today. May he bless it uh, to our hearts and use it for his purposes in our hearts. You know, it's interesting that... Uh, Jethro comes, and I hope you noticed in verse 1, we are told that Jethro had heard of all that God had done. So this wasn't going to be all new information that Moses was sharing with him. He had heard about these things previously. There's a lot of speculation goes into where Jethro's heart was at this point. It calls him a priest of Midian again, and the Midian, uh, the Midianites um, are ancestors that were not particularly followers of the one true God. And a lot of people think maybe at this point Jethro wasn't a full believer in the one true God, and others say, yes, he was, he's being reminded of that, and he's just expressing a faith. And either way, um, this isn't new information, but it seems very clear that God is working in his heart in the recounting of this story by Moses to Jethro. But there's also a fulfillment here that takes place, like much of Exodus, we're reminded, if you flip back a few pages to chapter 10, Uh, Chapter 10 begins this way in verse 1 and 2. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, now this is in the midst of all the, uh, the plagues that are taking place. The Lord said to Moses, go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine among them. And so God is reminding Moses, look, I am uh, allowing Pharaoh to rebel against me continuously because I'm going to show over and over who I am. Verse 2 says, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them. And God says, I'm going to do some things that you're going to be able to tell this tale. You're going to have that you won't believe it if I told you moment. But verse 2 closes this way. He says, not only will you be able to tell this in the hearing of your son and your grandson, he says, I'm going to do this that you may know that I am the Lord. And so Moses gets this reminder, and now Jethro gets to be the recipient of this story that gets passed on is God says, I am doing these amazing things. Now some time has passed in between now when Moses and Jethro meet from when this was said, but we're seeing Jethro gets to kind of play out what uh, God had promised would happen, uh, that you're going to get to tell this story and people will know that I am the Lord. So I want to use this story as an example that it's Moses' story, it's going to be Jethro's story, it's my story, and it's your story, that if we are among the redeemed, then we should say so, and our story is always the same. It is, we move from what we'll call alienation to redemption. That is, we always move from being separated from God. Our sin eternally separates us from God. But the New Testament tells us in Jesus Christ now he has come, paid the penalty for our sins. Our righteousness um, comes from Jesus Christ and now we can move from being enemies of God, aliens, to now being part of the family of God. Not only saved, redeemed, but also being made more like Christ. That's the story of all the redeemed. So let's kind of compare the story that Moses tells and Jethro's reaction to how God still continues to tell his story through you and through me. So this story of alienation and redemption. Notice how uh, verse 8 starts this story. The Mo- the, uh, then Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them on the way, and then this, and how the Lord had delivered them. 
Now you talk about a you're not going to believe what I'm about to tell you story. When Moses gets to tell Jethro, some of what Jethro apparently has already heard, but he's going to say, wait till you get a load of this. Imagine Moses getting to share all the things that have happened when he left near the beginning of Exodus from Jethro after being 40 years in the Midian desert with Jethro and his families where he met his wife, and now he goes to Egypt. Think about all that has happened in that. The ten plagues. The Passover at the end of the ten plagues, the crossing of the Red Sea, the judgment of the Egyptians, the water from the rock, the manna falling from heaven, the defeat of the Amalekites with Moses standing on the hill or sitting on the hill with his staff raised. What an amazing deliverance God has given to them. And then right in the, the midst of this story, we get a, a, a kind of a, a, a cue, a, 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 almost a, a device in which this story is told by Moses' two sons. Now, if you were reading through there, their names are given, and then in parentheses, um, there's something we're told about their names, and it's this is what their names mean or what they sound like um, and helps tell this story. So notice this. His first son was Gershom, and it says in parentheses, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. The name Gershom sounds like the word for sojourner. Now we've mentioned that word a couple times as we've gone through Exodus, but it really means alien. It means this place in which I now live is not my home. And Moses says, I was in Egypt, part of God's people that was enslaved. I was alienated from what God had intended for us. All the goodness of God's promises seemed like a foreign concept to those who were aliens and strangers in a foreign land. But then his second son is named Eliezer. In parentheses there it says um, in verse 4, For he said, The God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. So Gershom sounds like sojourner or alien. Eliezer means God is my help, or my God is help. In fact, Moses named his, as he was naming his sons, he was telling the story of his life. The names of his sons are helping him to tell this story that I was once far away, and now I've been brought near. I was an alien, really an enemy, the gospel tells us in the New Testament. I was dead in my transgressions, but now in Christ, I have been made alive. So along with Moses, we can tell that story. Now, I doubt any of you have children named Gershom and Eliezer. But you have that story. You have that history. You have that you're not going to believe what God has done in my life. That story of alienation to redemption is the story of God's people. It's Israel's story. It's Moses' story. And once again, it's my story. And I hope it's your story if you are in Jesus Christ. And so this is the story, alienation to redemption. And now we get an example in uh, Jethro's life that he's responding that that story is now causing him to recount that God is doing the same in his life. Notice starting in verse 9, what Jethro's reaction is to the story that Moses has told. So really, Moses' story is summed up just in verse 8. Then Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them in the way, and how the Lord had delivered them. Now that's a one-verse summary of 17 chapters of Exodus. But no telling how long Moses took to tell that story and what a great story it was. And so now we get to read, what did that do to Jethro? How did that affect him? And we get to see his response. And we get to see it in consecutive verses. 9, 10, 11, and 12. All are different parts of his reaction. So notice how he reacts. And I hope this is our reaction to the story of redemption as well. First, it says he rejoiced. Verse 9 says, And Jethro rejoiced, and here's the key, for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel and that he had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. 
There's an interesting Hebrew word there for rejoice. Uh, it's a word that's only used three times in the whole Bible. And it's a word that kind of expresses not only joy, but kind of an astonished joy. He is flabbergasted. It's beyond comprehension that God has done such marvelous things. And so he's amazed and even to the point of joy in his life to hear what God has done. And I think I would ask you, have you told your story? Do you regularly tell your story of redemption? Have you told your story this day, this week, this month? Do you let others know that you too have come from alienation to redemption, from death to life? It's a story that is worth telling. The redeemed of the Lord should say so. Jethro is ecstatic here because of this story. So his first reaction is, that is amazing. We should tell our story because it is a story worth telling. It's one of the greatest stories that we could tell, is that Jesus saved a sinner like me. But we see a progression. Lots of people can be amazed and maybe even happy for us, that's sometimes a reaction. I know we live in a world today, we get a lot of pushback about telling our story of faith, but by and large, people tend to be mostly happy. If you have a life that's been transformed from death to life, people go, oh, I'm so happy for you. And maybe they don't reach quite that point of amazement just in our telling just yet, but here we're seeing now the, the story of redemption has now began to stir in Jethro's heart. And so he moves from just rejoicing, maybe for God's people and for Moses. Now he begins to take it to heart. Verse 10 says, Jethro says, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. So this word blessed just means now he's speaking well of or he's esteeming or adoring God himself. So he's heard the story of the Lord God of Israel and of Moses, and now he is engaging and saying, I too will lift up high the name of the Lord. And so I would ask you again, have you and do you lift up the name of the Lord? There's kind of a secret to telling your testimony. Um, sometimes in evangelism, um, people think, well, I just don't have that great a story to tell. Well, let me just remind us that the story of redemption is not a story about me. The story of redemption is about God's work in Jesus Christ. So everyone has the greatest story ever told to tell is that God has done the work on the cross. Jesus died for our sins, and in his death, we were given new life. That's always a story worth telling, and when we tell it, we exalt God. Not me, not my story. Yes, what God has done in and through me might be part of the story, but the story is about God's work. And so along with Jethro, we can rejoice, but we should also bless the Lord. Our testimony, our story of redemption is not look at me, it's look at the Lord and his mighty power, his grace, his mercy, his love for his people. So do you rejoice at God's work? Do you bless the Lord? Do you exalt, do you esteem, do you tell of the greatness of God in your story? Now, we get really to the heart of the matter here in verse of 11. He has rejoiced, he has blessed the Lord, and so now we hear that he knows, he believes what God is doing, and he believes something important about God. Verse 11 says, Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods, because in this affair they have dealt arrogantly with the people. I've made a case to you that throughout those ten plagues in Egypt, from the Nile turning to blood all the way to the Passover, that God was demonstrating that the false gods that Egypt trusted in were all done away with one by one. Each one of those plagues, we could say, makes a case against some type of god or gods that Egypt believed in. In fact, the Nile, the very first one, is where they believed their life came from. 
to where they drank from, they fished from and all that. When it's turned to blood, that was all taken away. And God says, you want to trust in something besides me like a river? I'll take it away from you. And on and on throughout all ten plagues. And as Jethro gets to hear this story of Moses, the story of redemption of God's people, he says, now I know that God is greater. Really, it's a way of saying God is the God. He's the only God. And he says, I know this because the the Egyptians dealt arrogantly, it says here. They rebelled against God. They shook their fist in the face of God. And God demonstrated his greatness, his power, and even his love for his people and his judgment against these evildoers. So this know here, now I know that the Lord, that's not just a head knowledge, that's a word that uh, has a connotation of relationship that Jethro is saying, I'm all in on this now. I'm trusting in this God now. I can put away all other notions. Whatever it meant that Jethro was a priest of Midian, whether he was still practicing as a priest of some other God or gods, or whether he's a priest of Yahweh, uh, of Jehovah God, uh, in the place of Midian. And either way, now he shows this uh, kind of... uh, higher level of acceptance, belief, and trust in God. He's rejoiced at what God has done. He has esteemed and blessed the Lord. And now he says, I have believed what God has done. And then the next verse, if we move down to the first part of verse 12, it tells us something very important. And this ought to be sort of the sequence that we see take place. Lots of people can be in awe of what God has done. Lots of people can even say, boy, God must be great. But once we come to know, to believe and trust and give ourselves fully in faith to God, this next thing has to follow, that we must worship God. Verse 12 says, And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. A burnt offering was a representation at this time in history of full devotion to God. This is the ultimate thing I can do is now I'm giving of myself wholly to God. Jethro is offering up his life to the Lord. So he's given lip service to it. I know, I believe, and now he's demonstrating it with our life. So I would ask you this. Those last two things of believed and worshiped. Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? Have you trusted in him for the first time? Or maybe today we need a reminder. Our trust is in the Lord day by day and moment by moment. Are you trusting in God? And if you have, then is your life demonstrating that belief, that trust, and that knowledge? Are you worshiping the Lord? And worshiping the Lord isn't something we do one hour a week on Sunday morning. Worshiping the Lord is an entire lifestyle. It is our life in general. It's giving of all of ourself to God. And what I do, what I say, where I go, um, all the things about our life are now given to the Lord in worship. Yes, we set aside a special hour on a special day for worship. But worship is something we should do all day, every day. So Jethro is demonstrating to us, if the story of redemption is mine, then yes, I will rejoice. Yes, I will bless the Lord. And yes, I will believe, but I will now act upon what I believe. I will worship the Lord fully in all those things. And then the last thing in the second part of verse 12 It says, And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. See, a a meal in Moses' day was sort of the highest form of community. We would call that fellowship in a New Testament sense. This meal was shared with elders, with Aaron, who was a leader, who would, uh, the priestly line comes out of that. But more importantly, it says that it was done Um, before the Lord, and actually it's before his face. And so now there is fellowship that takes place. And we don't have time to delve into all that fellowship means, but it means at least this. He was now sharing his life of faith with the people of God. 
You see, Jethro now is being transformed. He is a changed man. Now, whether it's a gradual process over all these many years or whether it was instantaneous in this telling of this story and the sharing of the good news of what God has done, it is important that we recognize he is a changed man. That he's rejoicing, he's blessing, he's believing, he's worshiping, and now he is sharing his life. There's some irony in today's sermon that I am preaching to literally empty seats here in this room today. But there's no doubt in my mind as the people of God, as a body of Christ, we still are sharing our lives together. I spent almost as much time this week on the phone with those that are going through difficulties or sick, recovering from surgeries, uh, those who have had um, tragedies in their family, some whose health is failing. I've talked with, I've prayed with those people today. That was every bit as important of a shared life as it will be for us to watch a video together. See, God meant for his people to share in fellowship. And when we do it with each other, we do it before the face of God. It's an important aspect of our faith. We don't live in isolation from everyone else. We are meant to be together in fellowship. So I'd ask you again, are you rejoicing? Are you blessing the Lord? Are you worshiping the Lord? Are you trusting in the Lord? But let's not forget, are you sharing your life with brothers and sisters in Christ? And part of sharing that life is telling our story. The ups and the downs. In fact, I've talked with more people this, way, this week that are in sort of the down parts of life. Difficulty and strife and turmoil uh, that takes place in life. But every one of us now can still see the goodness of God. We can rejoice that there is a God in heaven that not only sees all that's going on, but acts in the midst of our life. We all have that story to tell. And here's maybe what I hope you're, you're beginning to see. When we tell our story, we're really telling God's story, and God's story is effective in the life of others. You know why Psalm 107 says the re redeemed of the Lord should say so? Because it's ordinarily the way in which God works in other people's life is when you tell your story. So let me end this way. I hope this week I challenge you to do this. Maybe it's today is that whoever you've gathered together with to watch this uh, message together, that not only have you shared in a time of worship together, but maybe over a meal like Jethro and Moses and the others here, that you will recount some of the good things that God has done in your life. And maybe uh, it's a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker, maybe this week, you look for the opportunity to say, you know, I've been wanting to share with you something that is the most important thing in my life. I want to tell you a story that you will not believe and tell your story from alienation to redemption. And I think we'll be amazed. We'll be able to rejoice and bless the Lord that he can use that story just like he used the story of Moses and God's people. You see, I don't think God did those miraculous things in isolation in a way in which maybe we don't see them uh, normally that spectacular worldwide events taking place, but God is, ever, uh, is still in the business of transforming lives. And it's just as miraculous when he does it for me as when he did it for Moses or for Jethro. So I hope you'll share that story. You will uh, fellowship with others around you. And I hope you'll pray that God will use your story uh, in transforming the lives of others because your story is his story. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your Son, Jesus Christ. We're thankful that we have gathered in his name. Uh, your Spirit has been here with us. And I pray that uh, we could, in our own hearts, first and foremost, recount and rejoice in the transformation that's taken place in the people of God, that each and every one of those who've called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ would rejoice in that today, in the miraculous salvation that's take pla taken place through Jesus Christ. 
I pray that as we, uh, our eyes are drawn to our Lord and our Savior dying on a cross to save us from our sins and raised in new life, that we too uh, could see that transformation taking place in us. That we who were once dead have now been made alive. Those who were blind are now seeing. Those who were lost have now been found. And we walk with Jesus Christ this day. I pray that we would have opportunity to share that story and you would use it your story of transformation and redemption in our lives to bring others to saving faith in Jesus Christ. So we thank you that you continue to do that, that we have a privilege of serving and worshiping you as part of your plan of redemption in this world, and we trust ourselves to be used by you. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.